Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship at Colonial Service this Sunday morning. We're glad that you're with us, and I invite you to pray with me now as we begin. O oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome, welcome, welcome to church. I know we can't be together with one another uh, physically, but we can be with one another in and through the Spirit. And it is a genuine honor and pleasure to be able to be with you and to share the word with you, to sing with you, to hear about how you're doing, to pray with you. And we just welcome you today for another opportunity, another Sunday when we can pause and be reminded of who the God is that we long to know more deeply and the love that that God has for all of us. So welcome. Uh, just because we are not getting together physically for now, that is gonna end hopefully one of these days soon, um, that doesn't mean we're not trying to find ways still to get together. And uh, so, in fact, this week uh, on Wednesday, there are two different opportunities that we want to encourage you to consider uh, attending. One is going to be from 530 to 7, both of these opportunities on Wednesday. So one of them is from 530 to 7, and it's a picnic with music, uh, and that will be for families. And so we want to encourage all of you who have kids and, and families uh, to, to feel free to come. There are going to be folks there who will guide you and direct you and show you how, uh, how things are going to unfold and the kind of social distancing uh, processes that we're going to use. And then from 7 to 8, we're going to have an additional music experience uh, as well. Uh, so, and that can, that's going to happen out in the parking lot. Uh, so we want to encourage you uh, to check those out. That, that information for that will also appear uh, in your e-news or you can find it on our website. Also wanted to thank everyone who um, took the time to read <coughs> Stamped and attended uh, yesterday morning our discussion uh, of that book. Uh, it was a really a rich discussion, a very rich and challenging book, uh, helping us as a community to wrestle with 
the history of racial injustice in our culture and society and learn maybe about what it might mean for us to become more committed to being anti-racist, uh, which I think is a desire that all of us have on some deep level. We want to embrace everyone, right? So the uh, last thing I wanted to do is just to remind you that after the service, I will actually also be offering a class. Uh, we've been doing a class over the last uh, several weeks. I think we're now in uh, session seven called the Early Christian Movement, and that will be available on Zoom. Uh, and that also information for that is also in the uh, in the e news. So, and now I want to invite you to watch this short video with Jeff Lindsay and John Seberg, our church moderator. Hi, it's Jeff Lindsay, your senior minister here at Colonial Church. I'm standing in front of our bridge. Our bridge has been one of those iconic, like the bell tower, spaces on our campus. Originally when it was built, the, the idea was that we would come across that bridge, we would come into our worship space and we would be met by the spirit and by the fellowship of like-minded people and God would meet us there and transform our hearts and our minds, relieving us by his grace and his mercy to send us back to the world, to cross back over that bridge and go back into the world with the good news, the good news and the hope that we have because of our faith. And you know what? <laughs> Since 1979, when we built this space, that has been a great image for us. Let's come together as the people of God and let us go back to the world with the good news that we've been reminded of, that God loves us, that the faith is for all of us, that there is redemption in the work of Jesus on the cross, and there's good news in his scripture. I want to suggest that that bridge, this bridge, or our iconic bridge, could symbolize something new. Hold that thought. Proverbs 3 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge God and God will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. If we were just going to lean on our own understanding as a church, well, you know what? We have a strong history. We have seen mighty work happen in and through our congregation here and around the world. So leaning on our own understanding, let's just keep doing what we've been doing. And God will bless it. The work will continue and all will be good. But you and I know in our hearts that that's not true. We can't keep doing what we've always done and expecting a different outcome. We've seen the foreshadowing. We, We've seen the possibilities. We're, we're not the relevant church we need to be. We're not the inviting church we need to be. We're not the church that's out in the world like we have historically been. And we got to get out there again. We got to get out there and continue to do the work that this church is built upon. History. Building for our future. Let's take the past, the good of the past, and let it inspire us and encourage and lead us into our future. This bridge, this bridge can be a path for us to go in the world, but it also can be an invitation to the world to come into our fellowship as well. That's what I want to suggest as we think about going forward.
building a bridge so that people feel welcome, that they can come as they are and experience the transforming work of Jesus, just like you have experienced, just like I have experienced and hope to continue to experience. But you and I both know the world has changed. The world is changing. And we have to do all we can to build bridges, to be invitational, to create space for others. And the only way we're going to do that is if we listen. If we listen and we listen well to what others are saying, what others understand us to be and what, and what others are thinking that we believe and stand for. The name colonial doesn't mean what it meant 75 years ago. There are people who are thinking about history in a new way that many of us didn't know and understand maybe back in the day. Well, it's not back in the day any longer. Colonial means the, the, the destruction of cultures. It means the taking over of land. It means a whole bunch of things that we don't stand for, do we? We don't. And we know that that name is a hurdle to many that we would love to see come across that bridge and be a part of who we are. I love that name. It has served me well. But I don't love it so much that I would, I would be willing to risk our future to hold on to it. And I'm wondering if you are as well. Let's do something bold. Let's do something that we couldn't even imagine a few years ago. Let's, let's give up our name that has become a hurdle to many. And let's create a new name that, that excites us and is about our vision and is focused on our future and says, you all come and be welcome and let's be the people of God together and let's do some great things in Jesus' name. Let's do that. Let's pray about that. Let's think about that. We're not telling you we're going to do this. We're inviting you as a congregation to think and pray with us about that. And then trusting the leading of God, the power of His Spirit, to go forward. Hi, everybody. My name is John Seberg, and I'm the church moderator for this church year. We're celebrating our 75th year as a church this year. And the name Colonial might have been the greatest name in, uh, in the world for the last 75 years. The question is, is it the right name for the next 75 years? I look at these things pretty simply. Uh, I, I think the mission of this church is timeless. Grow in Christ and serve the world. And, and it's not lost on any of you how much that runs in parallel with the two great commandments, to love God and love your neighbor. And I, I think that's where we need to focus. We need to have that help a new name emerge uh, rather than clinging to the, to the old name, which is not necessarily in sync with, with those two uh, key points. Brothers and sisters, please pray with me. Lord, we give thanks to you for this day, for the opportunity that we have to worship together in and through your Spirit. 
to be nourished by your word in song and sermon, and to be reminded once again that you are a gracious and living God, the source of our lives, and the one to whom we can turn both in times of joy and in times of need or sorrow. We pray this day for our world and its many challenges. We are daily reminded that our neighbors, friends, family, and all of humanity face many struggles. We pray for those regions around the world where strife and conflict rage. We ask for a cessation of hostility and for a truly just peace to prevail. We pray that you will heal the many deep divisions in our own country, that you will bring healing to our cities, to the countryside and the rural areas, to our prisons and hospitals and churches, to our schools and other institutions. We ask that you create fellowship where there is discord and bring understanding where there is only hatred. We pray also for our leaders and those who've been given authority over us, Give them not only wisdom in the many decisions that they are charged with making, but also mercy. Lord, we know that you hear the groaning of humanity. Be with those who face suffering, illness, death, injustice, and oppression. Let your spirit of comfort and liberation overshadow them in their great need and give each of us the strength and courage to be neighbors one to another. We pray also for the many, many needs facing our world in light of the coronavirus. We ask that you be with the medical professionals, with the single parents, with those who are charged with caring for aging parents and young children, with those who struggle with mental health challenges, with those who live alone for all of those who have been affected either directly or indirectly by this virus, we pray that each of them will know your presence, your love and care, and for good health and a vaccine or other remedy to be found. Lord, we pray for your body, the church of Jesus Christ around the world. Be with our brothers and sisters in their distress and continue to open our eyes to know how we might serve them and come alongside them in their needs. We ask that we may together continue to find ways to serve you through the proclamation of your gospel in word and deed in a broken world. We pray also for our community, Colonial Church. Be with our staff, our church council and deacons, as well as the many committees and all those involved in the work of this community. Grant all who serve wisdom and a discerning spirit so that they may know how to serve you and to further your will during this time and as we move forward. We pray also for the special needs of our congregation. We lift up all those who are sick and those who are in need of healing and those who are preparing to go into surgery, including Polly Patrick, Frank Pascarella, Jane Davidson, Bill and Nancy Lewis, Cresty Lydon, Betty Dresser, Patty Brufolt, George Lancaster, Don and Mary Lou Classy, John Bergman, Joe Findel, Chuck Ingwilson, Lynn Teschendorf, and all those whom we hold in our hearts. Lord, you know the specific needs of each of these persons, and we commend them to you. Spread out your healing hand over each of them and over their families, and be present to the physicians and communities that surround them and the trials that they face. Give them your spirit, O God, the same spirit through which you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We pray also for Mark Smith at the death of his mother, Hazel Thomas. Susan Ahrens at the death of her mother, Wilma Volkmer. Cliff Johnson at the death of his brother, Larry Johnson. Glenn Scudder at the death of his wife, Donna Scudder. We join with them in commending their loved ones into your loving care, O God, in your eternal presence. 
And we ask that you comfort these families in their loss and grief. In the depths of their loss, may they know your peace and your love, which has conquered death. We pray also for our Innovate Protégé Venture Miles and the work that they do in making a difference in the lives of people, both locally and around the world. In all of these things, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the time in our service when we get a chance to do something that God wants us to do, not just in a service, but out in the world, and that is to pass God's shalom to others, to people that we love, to people that we know, and maybe even to people that we have a hard time with sometimes. So when we pass the peace, when we come in here, and even though we can't be here together, we think about it as greeting one another, but it's way more than that. It's about extending ourselves to others and receiving something for others. So I want to encourage you now to pass the peace, pass that peace in your family, pack, give someone a call. If you need to stop the service, do whatever you need to do. But please take the time now to enjoy God's peace and pass it on. Good morning. I'd like to talk with the kids who are with you right now. So if they're not in the room, would you go get them and ask them to come and join us? We're going to talk about something very important today. We're going to talk about what do we do when we see someone being bullied. Have you ever had that experience at school, in the neighborhood, where someone's picking on you, saying things that are unkind, making you feel really bad? You know what? Even adults do that sometimes. So what do we do? Listen to this story, the true story, about a waitress named Jenica. Jenica was working at her restaurant one evening when she heard a man making really, really awful, hateful comments to an Asian family sitting at a table near her. They were there celebrating a birthday, and it was one of the first times they had come out together as a family after this COVID virus was present. The man making the comments, we learned later, was a CEO of a tech company he was probably used to having his own way and getting away with acting and talking in this way. Jenica stood up, looked him square in the face and said, no, stop, that's not okay. You can't talk to our guests like that. He still didn't stop and kept at it. He kept on using really bad language. So she stood there and said, you know what, you have to leave now. You are not welcome here ever again. You need to leave now. Now, Jenica knew who she was, and she knew what was right. And she also found her voice to be able to speak up for what was right. So, back to our question, what do we do when we see someone being bullied? At school or in our neighborhood, we can learn more about who we are, whatever age we are. We can learn what God would want us to say, what the good, positive, kind, strong thing would be to say. And we can learn to find our voice. When we do that, we can learn to let people know when they're doing something really, really hateful and wrong. We can learn to say, no, stop. That's not okay. It takes courage to do that. Sometimes being kind is simply being nice to someone. Sometimes being kind is being brave enough to stand up for someone who's being treated very badly. So I invite you kids, talk with your parents about this. Think ahead to what you could do, what you could say when you or your friends are in a tough spot. 
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, help us to learn to be like you, both kind and brave. Amen. Hey, kids, thanks for listening and thinking with me today. You have a great day. Take care. The scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 55. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The word of the Lord. Friends, what a challenging time we live in, absolutely. And this isn't new. You know, others have faced deep challenges in their times as well. One of the realities is that people who are oppressed experience that oppression for generations. It's not a sudden thing, and it lasts for so long that their prayer is often, Lord, how long? How long is this going to continue? How long before you fulfill your promises? African-American playwright August Wilson reminds us through his characters that people don't sing the blues to feel better but rather to understand life and find the strength to hang on. Now, Mary and Elizabeth in our story in Luke were both pregnant. Our story tells us that both were miraculous, both part of God's plan to bring a change that was going to come. Let's look at the words again. They weren't singing the blues. Elizabeth was actually exclaiming in a loud voice, and Mary was singing a song of victory. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zephaniah and greeted Elizabeth. Now, Mary had heard from the angel that her cousin Elizabeth was also pregnant. And to her, that seemed like a miracle because Elizabeth was so old. Was was she around 80 years old? So now she had heard from the angel, but now she wanted to talk with Elizabeth, find out if it was really true, and exchange their stories. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. Now, I I don't know what that's like. I, I can try to imagine, but I often think of the child moving in a mother's womb as changing position a little bit. Only this was so striking that the child leaped. I I imagine that's part of the reason she was talking so loud. Oh, Mary, what? And uh, she had that reaction. But Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud voice, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. 
Now, God's people have been waiting for a long, long time in painful and difficult times. And Mary believed that God had said what God had said through the angel. Years ago, Paul Simon wrote a, a tune, an American tune, he called it, that was about what people were experiencing back 50 years ago or more. He, he wrote, many the times I've been mistaken and many times confused. Yes, and often felt forsaken and certainly misused. But I'm all right, I'm, I'm all right. I'm just weary to my bones. Still, you don't expect to be bright and bon vivant so far away from home, so far away from home. And I don't know a soul who's not been battered, and I don't have a friend who feels at ease. I don't know a dream that's not been shattered or driven to its knees. But it's all right, it's all right. We've lived so well so long. Still, when I think of the road we're traveling on, I wonder what went wrong. I can't help it. I wonder what went wrong. Well, these words capture the feeling of the late 60s, over 50 years ago. They also capture the feelings that many people have today for different reasons, but similar feelings. Words like mistaken, confused, forsaken, misused, weary, far away from home. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And these words also capture the experience that many had during the time Luke is writing about in his account. And it's during a time like this that the angel appears to Mary and to Elizabeth and gives them the extraordinary news, the extraordinary invitation. Now, I've often wondered what kind of person do we imagine that Mary actually was. Back in the 50s and early 60s in Sunday school class, I got to picture that she must be a kind of subservient character, kind of shy, willing to go along with anything because she was so good. Well, maybe, well, sort of, well, not really. I, I've come to see a different view of her than that. We read the accounts of the angels coming to her and confronting her with the invitation, and she doesn't shrink back. She, does, she says, okay, I'm ready. Let's do this. I don't see her acceptance as acquiescence, rather a kind of feisty faith in God. She accepts she's willing to sign on for the adventure of a lifetime, a willingness to be misunderstood. She'll need to have a pretty strong personality with a clear sense of her identity to go through with this. And I'm thinking she had much of that beforehand. And that's probably why she was selected. She's saying, in effect, I know who I am. I'm not limited by that. I will step into your will, God. I will step into your calling for me. I will step into your dreams for my future. Now, we as a community are, are being called into our future as well. And I see Mary, this young girl, as a role model for us. We too know who we are. We know what we've accomplished and experienced through the years, 75 years for this particular community of faith. Our past doesn't limit us. It actually propels us into the future. And we too will step into God's will, his calling, his dreams for us. Now, there's a story of two mothers, brand new mothers, standing at the glass outside the hospital nursery where their babies were born, each looking at their newborns. One says, you know, the world is such a crazy, dangerous place right now. I wonder if I should even have had a child at this time. It's so dangerous. The other mother said, oh, I think actually this is just the right time. I believe my child will be used by God to make a difference in the world. My child will be part of the healing, part of the change coming. That would be Mary. My child is special because of God's calling on my life and on his. 
So Mary, in talking with Elizabeth, said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. See, she wasn't singing the blues. She was singing about her faith, her faith in God who was there for her. Her focus is on God. He's actually the center of the story. It's his action, what he has done, what he promises to do in the future. And then she says, For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Now again, they had suffered for generations in the past, and from now on and into the future, generations of people would recognize what God was doing right here. And he'll call me blessed because I got to be part of it. And then she goes on singing, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. She's talking there about the leaders who are so full of themselves. The ones who think history revolves around them. They think they are powerful. They are proud. They are rich. They think that that counts for something in the long run. Frankly, it it doesn't. This reminds me of my Aunt Shirley. Now, she was in her 80s, toward the end of her life, and uh, my wife and I would take her out to, to lunch or dinner from time to time. She was my grandmother's sister, and she had the best raspberry pie in the summer, and she had the best sugar cookies in winter. And she also had a wry sense of humor, and she, as we would say, had everyone's number. She had her opinions, and I enjoyed the fact that she shared them freely. We used to say that she was unimpressed with people who were self-impressed. God has scattered the proud, and so that's why she comes to my mind. They were so full of themselves, and they were unimpressive because of that. Mary goes on, she says, He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Author Eddie Glaude Jr. writes about James Baldwin, African-American writer, meeting with young African-American students at Howard University back in the early civil rights era. And he writes, as the meeting wound down, Baldwin was left to say the final words. All eyes were fixed on him. He said, if you will promise that you will never, ever accept any of the derogatory, degrading, and reductive definitions that this society has ready for you, then I promise you I will never betray you. The derogatory, degrading, reductive definitions. Never accept them. Mary goes on, He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Just, I can just imagine what a threat this would be to the political leaders of her day. If King Herod had heard this young woman, this young girl, soon to be young mom, saying these words, knowing that her son is the one that he had been looking for already and that he had heard about, he'd be furious. He'd start his vendetta even sooner. He he thinks that his wealth and power give him license to do whatever he chooses. It doesn't. He will be called to account in God's time. Now, our situations, of course, are actually quite different from hers. In her society, they had a dictatorship. We have a democracy. They had few rights. We have freedom of speech and many other rights. We even have the right to protest peacefully. They didn't. We now have to continue to guard and protect those rights, of course, and we have ways of doing so. But it's never easy, and we never take them for granted. But we have the privilege of living in a place where we have those rights offered to us. Mary goes on. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy 
according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. See, here again, it's all about God's promise, God's character, God's mercy to us. It was then, it is now. So the questions for us to consider today. First, are we ready to step out of our comfort zone and step into our own adventure? Will we pray for change and growth and believe that it will come? Keeping the faith. Will we offer our resources, feeding the hungry, caring for those in need? Practical, specific ways. Will we learn to listen to those who differ from us? And will we affirm God's call and direction for our community of faith? The next 75 years are going to be very different than the last 75. We're in a transition time. We're in a turning point. We need to recognize that. As we do, we need to listen to one another. We need to be faithful to each other and to our commitment to, to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Consider these questions. Think about it as we move into these next phases of our life as a church, as our lives as individuals. And let's come together. Let's make it happen as God leads us. Amen. Lift every voice and sing till the heaven ring. Bring with harmonies of liberty. Let all rejoice Oh.
Brothers and sisters, what a powerful message we've heard today from our brother Mark Patrick, whom we are grateful to have in our midst serving uh, and bringing forward his gifts uh, to bless this community. Now is the opportunity that we have uh, ourselves to give back and to continue to support the work of the church. There are three ways that you can give. Uh, you can give uh, the traditional way by sending in an envelope. You can give by uh, texting uh, CCE Dinah, or you can go online and uh, set up a way to give uh, through online. And if you're interested in online giving, check out this video, the short video by Michelle Moser. Hi, Colonial Church. My name is Michelle Moser, and my family has been worshiping at the church for a number of years. Uh, recently, a couple weeks ago, our family transitioned how we give our tithes and offerings to Colonial. We transitioned to the new online automated giving platform, and we really like it so far. The first reason we like it is it was super easy. I was sitting on the couch. I uh, did the whole transaction from my cell phone. It took maybe a minute, uh, only because I had to get up and go look at my routing number on my checkbook. Um, the second reason we really like it is that it's automated. So uh, the same day every month, the, the gift comes out and we're ready for it. We know it's coming and um, we're, we're, we're prepared. The, the third reason we really like it is that it makes our gift uh, to Colonial very, very intentional. It takes a lot of the emotions out of the gift giving process that um, were tough for us, the emotions um, that, that were changing from month to month, day to day, week to week. Uh, and by doing that, making the, the gift regular and intentional, I think it somehow made, made the gift giving process more joyful. I'm not sure how that has happened, but uh, processing through that one still. So if you haven't tried it yet and you think it might sound like something that works for you or your family, I invite you to give it a try. Thank you. So let me pray for us uh, very quickly to just bless the, uh, the gifts that have been given. Lord, we give thanks to you for your grace, which itself is a gift. And we thank you that you have graced each of us in different kinds of ways and that you allow us, you give us gifts that we can share with others, whether that be our time, our talents, or our treasure. We lift up to you all that has been given as a part of the life of this community, that you will bless it, that you will put it to work to change the lives of those around us and those who are perhaps in other parts of the world. We thank you, Lord, that you are a gracious and living God. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, for our benediction today, we're going to use Mary's song. We're going to adapt the words just a bit for us as we look forward to our future. So please, pray with me. Our Lord, we praise you for our newfound confidence. 
for your eternal awesome strength. You, the victorious one, turning things upside down, setting life right side up. You, the creative one, turning expectations inside out, destroying the arrogant. You, the compassionate one, healing the wounded, lifting the beaten down. You, the just one, showing the rich their poverty, showering the poor with blessing. A wonder, Lord, that we live to see it, that you choose us. Your mercy, Lord, flows from one generation to another and is flung from the past into the future. Amazing, Lord. Thank you. Amen.